in Acts chapter 6, there is conflict in the church, and seven men are set aside for the works of service and mercy. And we, uh, they are given the title diakonos, uh, deacons, uh, and this is the basis of the, the ministry of deacons to this day, uh, these seven guys. Uh, and so uh, I thought it was interesting, you know, these are very recent representations of these seven guys. In the lower one, you got the halo around Stephen and Philip. And so the halos, of course, are, these are the particularly spiritual guys. These are the guys that, uh, that are uh, martyrs for the faith or something like that. Um, and those are two, it's really interesting for those two, those are the two most prominent names on this list. Stephen is the first martyr. Uh, then we get Acts uh, chapter 6 and 7. Uh, we get the martyrdom, the ministry and the martyrdom of Stephen very early on. And Philip, Philip Philip the evangelist, uh, who uh, eventually his four daughters are the prophetesses, and uh, he is eventually associated after a long period at Caesarea uh, ha with the ministry at Hierapolis. Uh, so the upper one, uh, which is also very modern, has six of the seven with halos. Everybody but Nicholas. So... Anyway, so the story of Stephen, we know because it's in the book of Acts, and you know that he is stoned to death. The story of Philip the Evangelist, I already talked about that, um, uh, and it's believed that, you know, he was eventually crucified upside down or hanged by his heels or something like that at Hierapolis. Um, okay, Nicanor. Nicanor is uh, not otherwise known. Uh, you know, he shows up at the beginning of Acts chapter 6. He's named once and then never in the biblical narrative again. And there's very little history. But Hippolytus, writing very early, says that Nicanor was killed in the persecution that was launched in Acts chapter 8, verse 1. That after the stoning of Stephen, when there was a persecution of the church, that Nicanor was killed in that persecution, which, of course, Saul, who later becomes Paul the Apostle, is a leading figure in that and may have figured in the death of Nicanor. But that's all we know about Nicanor. Uh, Timon, uh, Timon is reputed to have gone to Cyprus with Barnabas and John Mark, uh, and then after Barnabas was killed, uh, have gone to Alexandria with Mark, uh, and then gone on to uh, Nabatea in Arabia, uh, where he uh, founded a series of churches uh, east of Judea uh, into Arabia, uh, and was eventually burned alive by the pagans. Uh, uh, Prochorus uh, is believed to have become the leader of the church at Nicomedia in Bithynia. Uh, Bithynia, of course, Pontus and Bithynia are places that Peter went as a missionary to. And he, where he writes to uh, Bithynia and Pontus as part of First Peter. Uh, Nicomedia is a significant city up there, and Prochorus is believed to have been the leader of that church for some time. Uh, he, there is some tradition that he traveled with John the Apostle for a period of time. Hippolytus says that, uh, that Prochorus is significant because, uh, because he traveled with his daughters, that his daughters were part of his missionary team. Uh, Hippolytus doesn't say how many daughters or anything about them, uh, but it does say that, uh, that he was a man who traveled with his daughters and they were part of the ministry that he had. Um, and he may have died at Antioch uh, under the Neronian persecution in the 63 to 65 AD era. Uh, Parmenas uh, is associated with ministry in a city called Soli, but Nobody knows for sure where Soli was or anything else about it. Um, this, uh, those sources are not the only ones that refer to a city called Soli at the time, but none of those references is specific enough to know where it was or who lived there or anything else about it. Um, and Parmenas is believed to have died a martyr. Uh, Nicholas, 
is the only one of these seven that there is nothing known about. There is no history, no tradition, no, not even rumors about Nicholas. So up at the top, why doesn't Nicholas have a halo? Because he's the only one that we don't know whether he was martyred or not. The other six all were, and so that's why that representation gives the other six halos and not Nicholas, because he, no one knows. Um, so anyway, but these are the seven deacons uh, who are associated not so much with the ministry at Jerusalem. They were not, there's not a long period of time between when they were appointed at the beginning of Acts chapter 6 and when they were scattered in Acts chapter 8 uh, and probably began to go to other places as the church was dispersed. Um, so, but those are the seven and the little bit that we know about the seven. So next slide. Um, so let's, uh, let's talk about some other uh, New Testament figures that we think we know something about. There's a bunch of people in the New Testament that all we know about them really is what's in the New Testament. And we've got almost nothing else. But Lazarus, Lazarus, uh, of course there's, uh, there are several people named Lazarus in the Bible uh, who are, uh, at least one of whom is a figure in a story and not an actual person who was living at the time. But Lazarus, uh, the, the one from Bethany on the Mount of Olives, is the beloved brother of Mary and Martha, a friend of Jesus. Uh, he and his sisters apparently routinely hosted Jesus when Jesus came to Jerusalem. And he is, of course, the one who was raised from the dead by Jesus, and as a result became a particular target of those who were opposed to Christianity in the earliest days. So uh, they, the fact that Lazarus was alive was significant evidence for the ministry and work of Jesus. And so there were people from the, from the time of Jesus' ministry that were wanted Lazarus dead because he was living evidence for who Jesus was and what it was that he had come to do. Um, so he is believed to have fled Jerusalem at some point, uh, partly because people were trying to kill him uh, or wanted to kill him at least. Uh, and probably he fled at the time of Acts chapter 8 in the persecution that began after the stoning of Stephen. Uh, that probably caused Lazarus to leave Bethany in Jerusalem. Um, he is long associated with a church at a place called Sidium in Cyprus, uh, and is reputed to have ministered there for some three decades. Um, uh, he is also associated with a church at Marseille on the south coast of France, which was then Gaul. Uh, there is a fourth century church in Marseille, uh, some 1,600 or more years old, which has down in the lower level a chapel, which is believed to, uh, to date to some time in the first century. Uh, the church is dedicated to Lazarus. And there are people in Marseille that believe that Lazarus somehow made it all the way to Marseille on the south coast of France. Um, and that uh, he ministered there and was a part of the early church there. Um, the traditions about Lazarus do claim that Mary and Martha, his sisters, traveled with him and were part of the ministry that he was involved in, wherever that was. Um, but there's at least a little bit of information about Lazarus. Uh, Silas, who is also known as Silvanus, one of those is a nickname and we're not sure which one, uh, uh, but uh, Silas uh, is named as an apostle, uh, went with Paul on his second journey. It's not clear by what basis Silas is an apostle, but the New Testament tells us that Silas is an apostle. Uh, that he and Paul went forth. It says that he was held to be a prophet in Acts chapter 15. Uh, he is listed as the co-author of 1 Thessalonians and 2, Timothy, 2 Thessalonians along with Paul and Timothy. Uh, Peter refers to Silas, uh, who he always calls Silvanus, um, as a faithful brother. 
So he was pretty well known to Peter by some means. Um, and only, the only other thing that we know about Silas is that he is said to have been scourged and tortured to death under the persecution of Nero. So that's AD 64, 65. And of course, the persecution of Nero uh, is the persecution under which Peter and Paul both died and quite a few other early figures in the church. Virginia? Yes. Yes, so, so this is when Paul and Barnabas split and Paul took Silas, this is that Silas. So, so he's associated with the church at Antioch. That's, that's a mission that comes from the church at Antioch. So he was at Antioch at the time uh, so that Paul could grab him and take him and go off on what we think of as Paul's second missionary journey where they went back through Galatia. And of course, that's the trip that they stopped in Lystra and picked up Timothy for the team. Uh, so, uh, so, and it's important to keep in mind that as Paul is on these missionary journeys, there's almost always a group of people with him, and only sometimes are they named. But on the third missionary journey, as he is starting to head back uh, east, you've got a list of uh, six, seven, eight guys that are traveling with him uh, that Luke lists off there. Um, so Apollos, uh, Apollos uh, was from Alexandria uh, in Egypt uh, and the great preacher. Uh, uh, he was uh, apparently a tremendous public speaker and preacher. Uh, at the time, uh, Alexandria was associated with a very alleg allegorical style of, of teaching and speaking. Uh, and so that may have been a key part of, uh, of what made Apollos as effective as he was. Uh, in Alexandria, being a great public speaker in the first century was one of the very best things that you could possibly do or be. Uh, it was uh, a, a road to great honor and respect, uh, great public speaking. And, and people that could use stories and images as a way to help other people understand what they were talking about um, uh, were greatly respected. And so, uh, so Apollos being an educated man who comes out of Alexandria was steeped in that tradition, almost certainly, uh, and that may have made him particularly effective as he went to other places like Corinth uh, and spoke because it was not the style that they were used to hearing. Uh, and so it stood out as a different way of speaking. And that may be one of the reasons why he was regarded as a great preacher. Um, so Apollos is named as an apostle. We also don't know what's the basis for that, keeping in mind that the apostles are people who were witnesses to Jesus and commissioned by him directly. And so Paul spends time establishing his apostleship in his letters. Here's how I meet these criteria. The 12, we know how they meet these criteria. When they added Matthias to replace Judas Iscariot, they went through the process of ensuring that the candidates were men who met the criteria that they had. For both Silas and Apollos, we don't know how they would have met those criteria. We don't know what their exposure to Jesus was or how they were specifically commissioned. We just know that both Silas and Apollos are listed in the New Testament as apostles. Uh, so uh, uh, Apollos goes to Ephesus in AD 52-53 uh, where he bumps into Aquila and Priscilla and they strengthen his theology. He's a great speaker and he knows a bunch of stuff, but they say, hey, there's a bunch of other stuff that you need to know uh, and strengthen him. Uh, he's a major figure in the early church at Corinth. The first and second Corinthians both make uh, references to Apollos and his impact on that church. Uh, uh, Paul also says that he has urged uh, Apollos, that he, he had contact with him or communication with him, and that he had urged pa Apollos to go to Corinth, and that Apollos turned him down. 
and said, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll go when it's, when it's the right time for me to go, but I'm pretty busy doing something else, uh, and we don't know what that was. But, but that's interesting because Apollos clearly did not see Paul as any authority figure over him, uh, uh, that they were peers to some extent, and that he could keep his own uh, schedule and priorities and do his own thing. Uh, that he was indeed commissioned directly by Jesus to this role. Um, and so uh, uh, in uh, the letter to Titus, uh, Paul asks uh, that Titus will ensure that Apollos and Zenos the lawyer are sped along on their way. But Paul doesn't say where they're going or why they would be in Crete. But apparently they... Uh, it, is, it is believed by some that they were passing through Crete, perhaps on the way to Jerusalem or Judea, uh, that they were eastbound, and that Paul wants to ensure that they are able to move quickly and that they get as much help as possible on the ground to keep going. Um, uh, alternatively, Jerome, writing in the early 4th century, says that Apollos and Zenos had been at Corinth and they had left in disgust over the division and the backbiting and the infighting and that they had basically thrown up their hands and said, we're done with these people and, and had gone to Crete and were engaged in the work of the ministry there. And that Paul, when he's writing to Titus, is saying... Now that we've reached an agreement for Apollos and Zenos to come back to Corinth, speed them along the way, get them moving, help them to get going and get out of Crete and get on the road uh, so they can get back to Corinth, uh, that they were being called back. Uh, but we don't know about that. Um, and we don't know anything else about Zenos the lawyer uh, uh, other than the fact that he is mentioned in Titus. Uh, so uh, we don't know anything about his role. Um, uh, Apollos is uh, at least the possible, the possible author of the book of Hebrews, uh, and many think the probable author of the book of Hebrews, a great uh, uh, a person who was very strongly committed to the idea that Apollos was the author of the book of Hebrews was Martin Luther. Uh, uh, Luther was very strongly of the belief that Apollos was the author of the book of Hebrews, uh, and that is pretty widely accepted today. Uh, almost anybody today who's looking at Hebrews thinks that Apollos is probably the most likely author. Uh, and of course, the other two candidates uh, that I pointed to have been Barnabas uh, and uh, and uh, Priscilla uh, are the other two uh, major candidates today. Jerome, uh, writing back in the early fourth century, said, no, no, Paul wrote Hebrews, uh, which is really odd when you think uh, he is dealing with the same order of books of the New Testament that you have in your Bible. And what is true about the book of Hebrews in the order of books in your New Testament? It's not with the books that were written by Paul. All the books that are written by Paul are together. Letters to churches, letters to people. Each group longest to shortest, right? Okay, the letters to people, 1 Timothy is the longest, Philemon is the shortest, four books. Okay, letters to churches, Romans is the longest, 1 and 2 Thessalonians are the shortest. Hebrews isn't in that group. Hebrews is in the group with James, 1 and 2 Peter, 1, 2 and 3 John, other epistles by other authors, which are also by length. You knew that, right? Right? Please nod. Please say yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. <clears throat> this, is, this is your New Testament, right? And you are familiar with it? Okay. Your New Testament has four Gospels, okay, and then a historical book, and then a whole bunch of letters from Paul. The first group of which is letters to churches, long letters to short letters, and then letters to people, long letters to short letters. 
And then there's other epistles written by other authors, long ones to short ones. Last one is the shortest one, which is Jude. I mean, 3rd John is shortest, but 1st John, 2nd John, 3rd John go as a group, okay? Okay, and then you've got Revelation. That's your New Testament, right? Okay, which is, you know, when you're thinking about the 27 books of the New Testament, that's pretty easy to remember, right? It has to fit somewhere. So, but, but Jerome, at the beginning of the fourth century, knew that Hebrews was already established in the order with the books that were not written by Paul. And yet he said, no, no, it's definitely written by Paul. And so for a thousand years, the church said, well, yeah, Hebrews is one of the books that's by Paul. It's just not in the right order in the New Testament. But there's nobody before Jer Jerome that thought that Hebrews was written by Paul. Um, and it's not clear why Jerome thought it was. I think Jerome seemed to be very influenced by the fact that Hebrews is so rich in theology and that therefore Paul is the great theologian and therefore it must be connected to Paul. But, but it's more likely that it's connected to somebody else and Apollos is the most likely one. He, so Apollos is a Jew from Alexandria with a Greek name. And so the big question about Apollos has already been, has always been, since he had a Greek name, and he came from Alexandria, which was so influenced by Greek philosophy and so influenced by paganism, could he have really been the kind of deeply steeped in the Old Testament Jew that it would be required to write the book of Hebrews? But the Jewish community in Alexandria was very large and very strong and very steeped in the scripture. So it's possible that he could have been part of that Jewish community and really been built up in the scripture. And either Apollos was a name that was given to him to use as he went out into the larger Alexandrian society so that, you know, he wouldn't have, I'm a Jew plastered on his face and he would be more able to do business or something. Um, uh, or the name that he picked up when his parents decided having steeped him in the Old Testament scripture to give him a, a Greek philosophy and poetry kind of a, an education on top of that. Paul, of course, went to the school of Gamaliel, but along the way somehow picked up this deep knowledge of Greek culture and background I mean, Paul's the guy that's quoting Greek poets in his epistles, right? So, so Paul is deeply in that culture. And so it's possible that Apollos is a guy, a Jew, with a very strong background in the Old Testament who picks up all this Greek rhetoric and poetry and these ideas on top of that. So... Anyway, but, but we don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews, so that's one of the questions that you can ask uh, when you get to heaven, uh, because uh, uh, no, no one here knows. Uh, so, but, but Apollo seems like the most likely candidate, but that certainly cannot be proven. Uh, you know, and like I said, in my heart, I'm always hoping it's Barnabas. Um, so anyway, uh, that's just me. Uh, so uh, uh, Trophimus, uh, Trophimus uh, is a Gentile from Ephesus who is on the last part of Paul's third missionary journey. He was the guy that went, uh, he's one of the people that went with Paul to Jerusalem. Uh, and it was the rumors, and Trophimus was seen in Jerusalem with Paul, and rumors about that caused the riot in the temple because people who were spreading uh, fake news, if you will, um, uh, started telling people at the temple that Paul had brought Trophimus, a Gentile, into the inner courts of the temple in violation of the law. And this resulted in a riot and Paul's arrest and his eventual sentence to Rome uh, to be tried before Caesar. Uh, so Trophimus is not guilty of this accusation. Uh, there's zero evidence that he entered the temple or had any intention to do so, but he was the means by which uh, Paul was arrested. Uh, uh, 
Yeah. When Paul's writing 2 Timothy, he says, Trophimus, I left at Miletus, he was ill. And apparently he had to be pretty ill if he couldn't travel at all. Um, so, uh, so he had uh, that 2 Timothy, so that's after Paul's first Roman imprisonment. So Trophimus apparently was on his team uh, in whatever Paul did between his house arrest for two years in Rome and his return to Rome when he was arrested and put in the dungeon that he writes 2 Timothy from. Um, and Trophimus is believed to have been with Paul at the very end to have left Miletus and caught up with Paul and to be, have been beheaded outside the city with him. Um, uh, so uh, that's Trophimus. Uh, Tychicus, uh, Tychicus is a trusted agent of Paul. Uh, he calls him a dear brother and a faithful servant. He's from Asia like uh, Trophimus, the Ephesus area, Asia being that Roman province, is just a piece of what is now Western Turkey at the time. Uh, uh, Tychicus uh, is sent to uh, both Ephesus and Colossae as an encouragement by Paul. Uh, so he was a guy that Paul sent to, uh, to encourage people uh, and to affirm them in the faith. Uh, he is the guy uh, that is sent to relieve Timothy uh, at Ephesus so that Timothy can go do some things for Paul. And uh, when Paul writes to Titus, he says that Tychicus is one of the two guys that Paul will send one of them to Crete to relieve Titus of his responsibilities there so Titus can go do things for Paul. So Tychicus is a guy that Paul has significant confidence in. Uh, tradition later has him as a bishop, but the traditions uh, that have him as a bishop later on are tied to three cities that are really widely geographically dispersed. Uh, one of them is in Bithynia, up on the south coast on the Black Sea. One of them is near Ephesus at the western end of what is now Turkey. Uh, and one of them is on Cyprus. Uh, so, so only one of those could possibly be true. Um, so, uh, but that's some stuff about Tychicus. Um, Rufus. Rufus is the son of Simon of Cyrene in Mark chapter 15. Uh, Rufus and Alexander are his sons. Rufus is the son who ends up at Rome when Paul is writing Romans. So he shows up in Romans chapter 16. Uh, and Paul in Romans chapter 16 points out that Rufus's mother uh, is very dear to him and has been a great help in his ministry. Uh, decades later, Rufus is uh, praised by Polycarp, the bishop of Smyrna. Uh, at the uh, very beginning of the second century uh, as a key leader of the church in Asia. Uh, and Polycarp, in writing his epistle to the church at Philippi uh, in A.D. 110, 112, something like that, um, uh, lauds Rufus as an inspirational martyr of the church and mentions that Rufus had been beheaded at Philippi in about A.D. 109. Um, Hippolytus also says that Rufus had been an overseer of the church at Thebes and Boeotia, which is associated with Luke. Um, uh, so that's uh, 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 Rufus. Uh, Linus, uh, Linus uh, is a guy who was with, with Paul in Rome at the uh, time of 2 Timothy. Uh, uh, and is, is believed to have been the bishop of Rome from about A.D. 56 until his death in around A.D. 67, uh, and that he was one of the last killed as a result of Nero's persecution. Um, uh, so Jerome in the fourth century said that uh, Linus succeeded Peter as the bishop of Rome. And Jerome is the first to say that. That has led to a Roman Catholic tradition uh, that, uh, that uh, moves the time of Linus's service to uh, A.D. 67 through A.D. 76, uh, pushes him later so that he can be after Peter. Uh, uh, so, uh, and Eusebius has him dying around uh, A.D. 80 and not being a martyr. Um, he was probably succeeded as a bishop of Rome by Clement, uh, 
And so, uh, in reality, Linus is the first bishop of Rome and Clement is the second. Uh, in Roman Catholic tradition, they are the second and fourth bishops of Rome. Um, but that's probably not accurate. Um, Linus was apparently appointed to lead the church there when Aquila declined or was unable uh, to be the leader of the church at Rome um, uh, and is believed to be buried on the Vatican Hill. Uh, Onesimus, uh, the useful one, a slave of Philemon who had fled and gone to Rome where there was work and opportunity to blend into the crowd uh, and bumped into Paul somehow and was converted by him and Paul sent him back to Colossae to Philemon with the epistle to Philemon and perhaps the epistle to the Colossians. Um, and Onesimus is later believed to have succeeded Timothy as the bishop of Ephesus. Um, and to have spent uh, maybe a decade or so doing that uh, and to have died uh, in the late 90s in Rome after having been arrested and taken there. Um, uh, uh, Andronicus and Junia. Andronicus and Junia are two people that are listed in Romans chapter 16. And Paul says that they are his kinsmen and it's hard to know whether that just means Jews. Probably not. He probably means something more than that. He means some more closer relationship than just being Jewish um, or just being part of the same Jewish tribal identity. Um, he probably means a closer relationship than that. Uh, and, and Paul says they are outstanding among the apostles. And this has confuse people for two millennia because we got zero basis for knowing how Andronicus or Junia would have become apostles. By what means would they achieve this apostolic status? And, and so there's a possibility that the outstanding among the apostles maybe means more like outstanding before the apostles, all the apostles know them or something like that. But it's been taken pretty literally by a lot of people down through the ages in the church. Yeah, Junia is a female name. Andronicus is a male name. And so, well, it's possible that they were married. Uh, and, you know, maybe this is Paul's sister, who is maybe the mom of the young man who brought the information about the plot against Paul while he was uh, uh, imprisoned uh, after the riot at the temple. Um, uh, from about the 12th century, uh, scribes have changed Junia to Junius. Junia is a female name. Junius is a male name. And so people scribing the, the, uh, the scripture, uh, scribing Romans since about the 12th century, uh, turned Junia into a man uh, because they were probably uncomfortable with the idea of outstanding among the, the apostles being applied to a woman. Uh, but uh, before the 12th century, everybody believes that Junia was a woman. Uh, there are no early... Uh, sources that doubt that, uh, and Origen, uh, very early on, uh, believes that Junia was an apostle. So, no way of knowing how or why, but if she's Paul's sister, then it's a little easier to figure out where the connections might be on apostleship. Um, but it's not clear how either of them, Andronicus or Junia, could have seen Christ or been commissioned as apostles. Um, Andronicus is believed later to have been the Bishop of Pannonia in what is kind of the Danube Valley uh, region. Um, uh, so up on the northern part of, uh, the, really the northern edge of the Roman Empire at the time. Um, and so Junia might have been his wife, or maybe his sister, or maybe his daughter. Uh, but, but there's a possibility that Andronicus and Junia are a married couple, uh, and that maybe Junia has, one of the two of them has some personal relationship to Paul, um, some connection. So the idea that Junia was Paul's sister is not crazy. Uh, it's not provable, but it could be true. Um, so, um, and there are very early traditions that attribute miraculous healings uh, and other events to Andronicus and Junia. 
in their ministry together. Uh, and Andronicus is believed to have been martyred in sometime in the early second century. But, uh, but these are, those are the other people who are listed as apostles. So Silas, Apollos, Andronicus, and Junia are all listed or at least implied in the New Testament to have served as apostles, been called as apostles. Uh, and so those are some other people from the New Testament, uh, some names uh, that are worth remembering and some names that we know some things about. Mm -hmm.